If I'm going to get um, today's lecture started since I think we have a quorum. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Baker, MDPH, Professor of Pediatrics History, Director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanity, and the History of Medicine at the Duke University School of Medicine. Today's talk is entitled, Why American Neonatology Began in Chicago, the Story of Professional Territory, Eugenics, and Ethics. Dr. Jeffrey Baker is Director of the Trent Center for Bioethics and Humanities and History of Medicine. A Professor of Pediatrics and Practice of History, he has served for over 25 years as a general pediatrician in Duke's children's primary care with a focus on children with autism and special needs. Dr. Baker's historical work is also centered on child health. As the author of the book, The Machine in the Nursery, Incubator Technology and the Origins of the Neonatal Intensive Care, he is a leading authority on the history of neonatal medicine. Dr. Baker co-edited a 75th anniversary history of the American Academy of Pediatrics and has written numerous historical articles related to pediatrics, vaccination controversies, and autism. He directed the Academy's Pediatric History Center from 2009 to 2018 and continues to serve as the Pediatric History Monthly Feature Editor of the journal Pediatrics. He is also an active member of the American Association for the History of Medicine, for which he co-chaired the program committee for its 2017 meeting. Dr. Baker has lectured widely on historical topics to many academic audiences in North America. Most recently, his research interests have been centered on the history of racism in medical centers and their communities. He has co-led an interdisciplinary Bass Connections project in 2018 to 2019, documenting Durham's health history, understanding the roots of health disparities. He continues active work situating Duke University's own institutional history within the context of his community and has spoken to many local audiences on this topic. As the director of the Trent Center's History of Medicine program since 2006, Dr. Baker has taught history to undergraduates, residents, and medical students in all four years. In 2021, he developed co-developed a new interprofessional humanities elective, Moral Movements in Medicine. He has held many other leadership positions at Duke, including director of the Duke Autism Clinic, Duke Health Center at South Point, and the AB Duke Scholarship Program. In 2019, Dr. Baker was awarded the Excellence in Professionalism Aware by Duke School of Medicine. His book, Machine in the Nursery, Incubator Technology and the Origins of Newborn Intensive Care was published in 1996. And as we did learn in the pre-session chit chat, that this was the, um, the fruit of his PhD thesis. But I wanna, I wanna um, end this introduction by saying that Jeff is a colleague, friend, and most importantly, a kindred spirit. As a pediatrician with extensive experience, he deals with some of the most challenging patients, those with autism. As this lecture series has explored, there's a really wonderful cross-fertilization between history and clinical medicine. And to be able to do historical research and scholarship at the highest level and to be an active clinician is really what I personally aspire to. Finally, I always appreciate any lecture that shows the convoluted nature of medical progress at the same time highlighting an important Chicago historical connection. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Jeff Baker. Thank you very much, Mendy. You're too kind. And it's uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my only sadness on this is I wish I could see you in person. I see a lot of names here that are really recognizable to me on the your parents' names on boxes and probably a lot of others that will someday be recognizable to me. So just sorry I can't meet with you in person. Yeah, I, I really think highly of the McLean program and of the University of Chicago, which is I did travel to do some of my research for this project there. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and the obligatory. There we go. And Elaine, if you just give me a thumbs up, if you can see the title slide. Uh, and yes, I shamelessly pitched to Chicago for this talk, um, knowing that a lot of McLean fellows come from all over, but there, 
Chicago comes off pretty well in this talk, but we're going to hope to make some bigger points about what are the complexities around the story of uh, the history of American neonatology. Um, I have only nothing to disclose besides a, a minor project I've done with autism with Apple with, a, with, with, with an iPhone. Um, so the formal objectives of this talk are we're going to talk about how neonatal medicine began a lot earlier than most people think uh, in France in the late 1800s and how it came to the United States and how there's this strange story involving incubator baby shows and eugenics. We're going to talk about a bigger theme, which is how did responsibility for these babies pass from mothers to doctors? Um, and what, how did nurses play into that story? And we're going to try to I'm hoping the discussion in particular will be able to look at the implications of this early story for medicine today. Uh, so uh, I wanted to say a little bit autobiographically about my story. So I was a resident in the 1980s. And honestly, my rotation as a peds res as a medical student, as a peds resident in the intensive care nursery was very traumatic. Uh, I really was. I, I just remember as a place of uh, noise and alarms all the time these tiny fragile babies that seem to be overwhelmed by technology. At that point, we hardly ever saw parents in the nursery. It was a completely techno technologized, <laughs> that, that's a word, space. It was a disturbing, hard place to work. And you wondered what was happening to these babies? What were we doing to them? Often inflicting painful procedures on them. Um, and I'm sorry to say without uh, analgesia. Um, it was a time of controversy. Uh, and, and I was only partly, partly aware of all of this going on, but there was, it was a time when there were national controversies over questions of what was called the baby doe controversy. I'm going to say a little more about that toward the end of the talk, but a, a national controversy regarding parents who declined surgery to, to save the life of a baby with Down syndrome. Um, lots of controversy over whether we were going too far with this technology, with, with small preemies, who should make those decisions on and on. I was very affected by that. And um, I did toy with thinking about ethics uh, as, as a career, but I had done a lot of work in history and, I, and that led me to sort of ask questions that I didn't see being asked by all the ethicists who were so involved, who were, who were writing so many articles and books at this time. Um, it was kind of assumed that all of this controversy was new, uh, you know, it's sort of the, as the history of bioethics is often told is, in a framework of new technologies create new dilemmas that have never happened before. And so now we need a new ethics. Well, yes and no. <laughs> Intensive care technology was obviously pretty new. But I, at the end of my chief, as chief year, I attended a talk by a senior neonatologist. And that talk shared something I'd never heard before. There was, in fact, a long history of neonatal medicine. And it was a pretty bizarre history. Uh, there were long before mechanical ventilators for babies, there were incubators. And the incubator, which to me was kind of a boring technology, really, when incubators were first invented, they created a, a huge wave of interest in saving preemies in the late 1800s. And some strange things happened, such as incubator baby shows being set up in world fairs and sideshows, including where you are in Chicago. These were brought, uh, centered uh, as, uh, around a figure named Dr. Martin Cooney, we're going to mention him again, uh, who uh, ran one of these shows at Coney Island until 1943. Strange figure. Uh, Cooney, uh, so most neonatologists know nothing else about the history of their specialty, will have heard of these sideshows. Remember, one, tech, one neonatologist said, all I know about our history is we started as, as a sideshow. <laughs> So this has some, there's always a cottage industry of books written about this. Um, it seemed like an interesting story to explore. Um, as I learned more about it, I learned that this technology came from France. So therefore there was a promise that maybe I could get a trip to France out of all this. That's always good when you do a dissertation. Um, this story I also learned at an early point connects to Chicago because it turns out Chicago is really where the first uh, permanent premature infant nursery gets established in the United States. And the person who established it, it, Dr. Julius Hess, dedicated his book to Dr. Martin Cooney, who set up incubator baby shows in Chicago, including this is the Century of Progress exposition of 1933. Uh, and here's Dr. Hess. Dr. Hess is not a flamboyant figure. He's, he's a mainstream figure at the University of Chicago, and yet he dedicates his book to Dr. Cooney which is pretty wild to think about. 
So I decided I had within the first week of my dissertation of my of graduate school, uh, which I did after a residency, I had my dissertation topic already staked out, which is a good idea. Um, so I'm going to talk about how I really started off um, my dissertation really thinking about the bioethical questions in the nursery and kind of hoping to kind of look at this older story and kind of ask, you know, what questions can we learn? What, I'm sorry, what, what lessons can we learn from this early story? But the story took me on down so many twists and turns. It took me to this very different world. that it wasn't, it wasn't so simple as just saying, here are the lessons. I, I kind of came back looking at our own world in a very different way. And that's what I want to try to convey in this talk. And, to, to sort of make some connections with, with ethics, although maybe a little differently than not simply just lessons of history, if you will. So I'm gonna to try to pl plunge you in a journey that took me years uh, to, to understand. Um, and I wanna begin by just giving you a sense of, let's imagine you know, we, the babies who are in an intensive care nursery or special care nursery today, what would have happened to them if they're born in the 1800s? Well, they would have been born at home. And uh, typically, we, I think we can, from reading a lot of literature, this is the first chapter of my book, um, babies were born at home almost always in the 19th century. When a premature baby was born, they would be left at home with the mother um, and would be in the mother's care. A baby born more than two or three months early would probably have died within hours, maybe a couple of days at the most, maybe early enough, born early enough, they would have had immature lungs. But there's a very big population a baby is born just one to two months early. These are sort of 32 to 36 weekers today um, who do really well today. We don't worry much about them anymore. But in this time period, these babies, 32 weeks and above, even though they had decent lungs, they were very precarious. Um, and they had a very high mortality rate of about 50 to 70% in the first weeks of life. It wasn't from highland memory disease, immature lungs, it was because they're such bad feeders, they got cold really easily, they're prone to infection, but high mortality. And yet doctors didn't have any responsibility here. The baby would just be turned over to the mothers and it was up to the mother to try to rear the baby as best she could. Maybe the baby would be put into a, a laundry basket with, uh, and wrapped up well and, and breastfed as best she could, but many of them would die. So one of the questions that I was exploring is how does, response, how does the premature baby become a responsibility of the medical establishment instead of of mothers. And that is the story that's triggered by the invention of a medical intervention, which, which is the incubator. And we're gonna trace this in three acts, how it was invented in France, and there's a reason it was in France, not here. How it gets from France to the United States, and then what happens to the United States. Essentially, in my, my book, I explore how you can take the same technology in two different contexts to illuminate those contexts and understand the, the values that shape each of them. So that's what I want to try to outline to you in fairly fast form. Uh, so the first act, the invention story. Now let's get started. And uh, I told you there's a reason it starts in France. And it has to do not so much with science, but with really with war, <laughs> with nationalism. In 1870 to 71, France loses a war to Germany, the Franco-Prussian War. It happens really fast. It's an enormous embarrassment to France. You know, this is, you know, 60 years after Napoleon. <laughs> What's gone wrong? Politicians afterwards are going, what happened to us? And they find a reason to explain their country's deterioration in what they call the de population, de population. French mothers were having babies at only half the rate of the Germans. <laughs> uh, they were starting to do, do early kinds of birth control. Um, and uh, the implications, French politicians were very clear. If they didn't start producing more babies, they weren't going to have enough soldiers or workers to fight the next war against the Germans. So in this context, I mean, infant mortality is very high everywhere in the 19th century. But in many countries, it was sort of written off as kind of a fact of life. You just expect the babies to die at high rates. In France, it becomes a problem because it's not just a fact of life. It's like it's robbing the country of future soldiers and workers. So in that context, uh, doctors have the incentive to start putting energy into the, what's killing babies. Here's a cartoon for, uh, image from the time showing a French doctor who is feeding pasteurized milk to babies who are climbing over a hill, 
headed toward a cannon that again is presumably headed aimed toward Berlin. Uh, it, so doctors are attracted to this and not only pediatricians, pediatricians would have been part of this story uh, with pasteurization to, to address diarrhea, but obstetricians also are, are attracted by really the new prestige attached to reducing infant mortality. Um, so in this context, there's an obstetrician who becomes a kind of pediatrician. His name was Stefan Tarnier. And he was the head obstetrician at France's Maternité Hospital, the Paris's, uh, Paris's largest maternity hospital. France has a, a running start on most countries in that in Paris in particular, there was some large maternity hospitals. This goes from a tradition going back to the French Revolution. So um, whereas around the world, in many places, very few babies are born in the hospital. In Paris, that's not the case. You got about 20% of babies born in the hospital in Europe. They're still usually born to fairly poor women. Um, so Tarnia sees is, is the head, head OB there. And in this context of worries about depopulation, depopulation, he sees all these, these premature babies born one, two months early, and they're, you know, they're, they're having failure to thrive. They don't grow and they die within days. And he sees this now as a problem, not a fact of life. He looks for a way to warm them more effectively. And by the way, picture the maternity hospital is this great big stone edifice. It gets pretty cold in the winter, okay? So he finds an answer to one of these babies, actually had a visit to the Paris Zoo, where he sees the chicken incubator display. And he has the, said, well, this is actually a machine to heat up eggs. Can we do this for babies? He has the zoo's instrument maker make a similar device for the hospital. Um, and this will become the incubator. Um, and he has two models. Uh, the first one is a big machine. Um, there's a, a there's a Bunsen burner uh, that heats water that circulates through a big reservoir at the bottom. And the top container can hold four babies. Again, think about the connection to egg incubators. <laughs> you can just stack them in there. This was not real good for infection control, uh, but it did warm the babies. It was also kind of complicated. Uh, so within three years, he develops a smaller model that's just a one infant, one incubator model heated by hot water bottles. This bigger one is the more technologically advanced. Wonderful image, I love this image of uh, showing this being used in the maternity hospital. And this is an English magazine. So it shows this is getting some press around the world. It's a remarkable thing. These are generally uh, nurse, nurses uh, and wet nurses supervised by a midwife who are doing this. Um, that's Dr. Tarnier. The second big French figure in the story is his successor, a person named Pierre Boudin. And Boudin uh, will continue to carry on Tarnier's work with the incubator. I, I think I should have I skipped over one thing. Tarnier not only developed this machine, but he showed it made an impact. And this really needs to be highlighted. He showed that just the act of warming these premature infants who were born um, uh, through an incubator reduced the mortality of premature babies who are in the 1,200 to 2,000 gram range from 66 to 38%. That's a pretty big impact. Um, and this is 1880. <laughs> there aren't many things where you can have an impact like that. So, so I think a lot of what Tarnier did that is important is not just the machine, but showing that it makes a difference. That those numbers are so good, we might want to talk a little more about them. Are, are they totally believable? <laughs> but that's what he showed. And now his successor has a different kind of contribution. Pierre Boudin will, will continue to care of premature babies. He's got to write the first. Uh, He's another obstetrician who becomes even more of a pediatrician. It turns out in France, in this period, obstetricians are, the, are, are become sort of the group of doctors who supervise babies until they're about six months old. So a very different line than is gonna happen in other countries like the United States. So there's sort of an OB pediatric pseudo specialty that's forming here, which is I think part of the interesting backstory to this. Um, so Boudin is very much in this tradition. He published a book called The Nursling, um, on the care of premature babies and describes the story I've told you about. Actually, Boudin's contribution to the story is not really improving the technology. In fact, he embraces those that second generation, really simplified incubator. Um, the one that just says, it's, it's basically a box with triangular hot water bottles. That are, you know, it, do we even call this technology? It seems so simple, right? But he found it was very effective. But let me show you why he made a big deal of these small incubators. 
And this shows you where he used them. <clears throat> and the idea was these incubators <clears throat> were set up, whereas Tarnier had the incubators in a separate nursery area, Udan moves them back with the mother's beds. And here are the mothers around the room, and the, pre the babies are at the foot of their bed. Udan wanted the incubators to be made of glass. He wanted the mother to be able to see the baby and connect to the baby. Um, he wanted the mother to be the nurse. Uh, he wanted the mother to be breastfeeding the baby um, and to care for them and do the dressing changes. Because because he made a big point. He said, it's not just enough <clears throat> to save the baby. You must save a, a baby whose mother is capable of, he said, suckling it, of, of nursing it. And indeed, Boudin would continue to follow the graduates of this, I think what you could say is a mother-baby unit. He continued to follow them afterwards in regular clinics. He would see them, give advice about breastfeeding, um, weigh them. Uh, and in fact, this is the beginning of well child care. <laughs> Pediatricians are not doing this yet. Uh, Boudin begins this, and he's an obstetrician. So are you getting a sense of that this French, this, there's a style of te technology that's happening in France that um, we can't summarize it by just saying they had incubators. <laughs> it's a style of medicine that focuses on supporting the mother and the technology in some ways is an extension of her. <clears throat> um, so to kind of summarize that, this, this act one of the incubator in France is led by obstetricians. I wanna emphasize that. Um, it points to a, a different possible professional pathway than we eventually had in obstetrics. Uh, of aligned with pediatrics rather than GYN. <clears throat> um, the setting is in maternity hospitals, the cultural context is of nationalism and this pronatalism that comes out of that. Um, and uh, it centers on supervising the mother, promoting breastfeeding, less focus on the technology. Uh, these people are not making the technology more and more complicated. We're gonna, that's the move in the, in the next part of the story. Um, doctors like Boudin and Tarnier became heroes in their context. Uh, for, for saving all these babies. It was said that Pierre Boudin was eulogized at his death for having saved a battalion of babies for France. And it was later commented that had he lived till, till 1914, he would have seen the battalion go to their deaths, unfortunately. <clears throat> you can still go to, uh, to Paris and there is a monument to Dr. Tarnier and a mother and a baby and there's the incubator again. Uh, I don't know of any monuments to doctors who took care of premature, care for premature babies in the United States. It shows the enormous cultural weight to this. And yes, although I took this picture much more recently, I did get my trip to Paris as part of my dissertation. So real, that's the French story. And now what I wanna do is talk about how does this technology get from there to the United States and what, how, does it, how is it gonna change? <clears throat> um, and let's say a little bit, talk a little bit about what obstacles there were to the incubator spreading. So this French incubator campaign is mainly in cities and maternity, which do have maternity hospitals, um, which is still only where about 20% of French babies are born, which is still better than other countries. It became hard to apply this to other communities that didn't have, where babies were born at home. They did try, and I won't go into that, but it didn't work out very well. Um, how, if you wanna make an impact on future soldiers and workers, you needed to, to, to get technology out more broadly and um, to babies born at home. And, and that was hard. To some, it felt we needed a different kind of approach or different kind of institution. We can imagine a lot of ways to imagine this, but the interesting thing is that uh, the approach that really takes off is one that focuses on better incubators in a different place than the hospital. And here a figure comes in called, named, Dr. Alexand named Alexander Leone, who is a, he's, a, he's an inventor. Uh, he actually was a, he was a chicken incubator dude. He made lots of fancy chicken incubators. He's watching what, what's happening here with the babies uh, in, in Paris. And he says, I can make a better incubator. I can, because of my chicken incubator work, I can, I've got good thermostats. I can put in a ventilation system so I can keep baby free of infection. I can make something that's stronger, better, and uh, it, he, it can compensate for these challenges of bringing baby, uh, taking care of babies. Oh yeah, mothers may not want to take their babies to the hospital. Hospitals are kind of scary places to take your baby. So Leon said, I'm gonna develop a different kind of place that's more hopeful than the hospital. And he developed what are called uh, uh, 
works for babies translated, uh, charitable works we might translate it as. Um, storefront, um, in the English literature, they're called incubator charities. Storefront little ch uh, charities where Leon would set up little incubators <laughs> wards, okay? And um, babies could be cared for here. They were supported by spectators. <laughs> spectators come and watch, standing behind the guardrail, watch the babies, and that provided a staff of nurses. You can see we're on the slide, the, the slope now towards the incubator baby show, right? Um, it seems a little crazy to us. Um, but again, parents at this time are very ambivalent to take babies to hospitals because um, the, the very high rate death rate for infants there. So a, do, a new setting is more hopeful to them. Leon does a lot of promotion. He never publishes a single article in the professional literature as Charnier and Boudin did. But he puts out, he does interviews, he does popular magazine articles. Um, here's a picture of his graduates in Nice, France. All these were raised in one of his incubator charities. He's put out a message here, right? That these babies can be saved and they can be healthy and strong. And from there, it's a short step as he looks to influence people beyond uh, France to reach out to other countries. World fairs were the big way you promoted technology in those days. Uh, all to, you, if you've been to the Smithsonian, look at the old World's Fair exhibit. It's all about technology. Um, Leon's brilliant insight was, we can do this with babies in the exhibit. We'll get a lot more people watching. And he was right. Um, at his first exhibit, which is the um, actually the, the, the Berlin Exposition of 1896, um, it was a phenomenally successful, became the most popular exhibit at the World's Fair. And, um, and uh, this is an image from an English magazine uh, depicting it. Um, and this is a really fascinating image. And, and it gets us to think about the relationship again of the mother and the machine and the baby. Remember in, the, in that mainstream French obstetric tradition, the, the incubator is kind of being downplayed and simplified and the, the focus is on helping the mother breastfeed, supporting her. Now we've got incubators that are every bit as big as the mother, <laughs> okay? Look at the mother looking over. The incubator is like her. The, the, the caption for this magazine article was an artificial foster mother, um, infants at the, and I apologize, the Berlin Exposition of 1896. I, was doing, I typed this too late. Um, but they're rivals to each other. It's like the machine is coming a rival to the mother. And then on the left of her, there is, I don't know if that's a father or a man, but he's looking at the whole thing, presumably with much more scientific curiosity of detachment rather than feeling the challenge. Interesting image to me of what's happening here to the incubator. And, and so these shows come to the United States. And uh, this is the, the Buffalo Pan Ex American Exposition in 1901. Um, and uh, big deal. Uh, you know, a whole set of incubators, uh, nurses taking care of the infants. Look at these images and ask yourself, are these really sideshows? This is, I don't know if any of you are from St. Louis. Uh, this is the, St. Louis had, uh, had an incubator baby exhibit for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition of 1904. And it's quite a remarkable place, again. Um, a full battery of incubators and trained nurses. They had trained doctors covering it. They had a, a transport service. They even had a doctor um, who did studies in it. And those of you who are actually pediatric will probably have be used to the idea that due to the, uh, are, we'll be accustomed to providing uh, premature babies 120 kilocalories per kilogram per day to get them to grow. Guess where that study was done? <laughs> the St. Louis World's Fair. <laughs> that is, John Dahorsky did, did the first study coming up with that number. So really interesting stuff. And amidst all this is Dr. Martin Cooney. Oh, he said he was a doctor. He wasn't really a doctor. Um, that's just what he told the New, York, the New Yorker. Uh, Cody fabricated a lot of his own story. He somehow, uh, he, uh, he came from Europe. He became interested in the incubator baby show phenomena in Berlin. And he came to the United States and decided that Coney Island would be a great place from which he could launch incubator baby shows every year. Cooney is an ambiguous figure, I think. Uh, and uh, as I say, his main base is in Coney Island. Um, he, toward the end of his life in 1939, he was interviewed by the New Yorker. And he said, all of my life, I have been making propaganda for the proper care of, pre of premature infants. 
other words, he presented himself as a propagandist, somebody who's trying to get people to take seriously the idea that premature babies can be saved. Is that the message people took for, who, who paid to see his exhibit? This is an infant incubator exhibit at Coney Island. Um, it lasted, it, it's said to have been the longest lasting exhibit at Coney Island, uh, 1903 to 1943. Um, and you can see there's a barker in front. Somebody who's saying, come on in, you're gonna see these tiny babies. You know, that's definitely a midway or sideshow uh, phenomenon. I, I think these are somewhat ambivalent uh, exhibits. It's fascinating to think about. Are they sideshows or are they really about promoting technology? I think they're a bit of both, quite honestly. Um, <clears throat> sometimes in the World Fairs, they would be put into the sideshow part of the World's Fair rather than the technology section. Um, I think one of the big arguments I made in, in my work was that whereas most doctors have, have focused, most writers on this have focused on the sideshow aspect. And it, you know that's there clearly. And it's, it's a pretty weird story and interesting to talk about. I do think that we need to also emphasize the message of, of technological optimism that in some ways we need to picture this is a time when modern medicine, as we think of it, is just starting to take off. Um, the germ theory is you coming know, that's about. That's what I'm glad change. that you call me because uh, when I was- yeah. And uh, it's a time when th this is sort of like, there's a sense, especially in the World Fairs, that this is a hopeful technology pointing to the future. I think that's a big element of this. I think it's also sending a message that premature infants could be normal. And that's where I want to kind of shift to the context in the United States, why it would not be so readily assumed these babies were normal as in France. So that carries us into the third of the, of the, the act here, which is how do we, how do we get from these, the, the story of the incubator baby shows to the actual beginnings of neonatology as, as really a legit specialty within the United States? How does that happen? And um, it, it, the incubator faces a lot of obstacles in the United States. Uh, the, it's, it's not that doctors were unaware of it. I mean, you, you, you could find medical reports of Tarnier's invention that are appearing in the 1880s, 1890s. And the World Fair Exposition certainly did impart a lot of awareness of what the French doctors were doing. Um, although they would usually focus on the technology, not the bigger aspects of, of what they were doing with the mother. So many doctors take note of that and they, they try to make their own incubators, set them, in, set them up in hospitals. But in the United States, almost all babies are born at home. Um, so the doctors that do this, they're, they're treating babies who have been brought by, from a mother into the hospital. Usually when the baby gets there, it, the baby's on the verge of dying and they don't make it. Um, so the earlier years, to, to talk about the resistance of why, why the incubator doesn't work, a lot has to do with a simple the challenges of trying to use this at a time when hospital birth is very unusual. But the bigger co social context in the United States is very important. The uh, United States does not have, people in the United States, um, especially leaders, people who, have, who shape opinion, are not worried about depopulation. The United States has lots of babies being born. Now, they're being born mainly in the immigrant classes, right? Um, um, the United States, there is some there is concern from the uh, Anglo-Saxon elites that uh, their group isn't having babies fast enough. They talked about something, they didn't talk about depopulation, they talked about race suicide. They're not having babies the same rate, say, as the Irish and Southern, Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans. So this is a real different context. The prospect of saving a baby is gonna feel different in this context. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a crusade to lower infant mortality. Um, 15 to 20% of babies in America, in, in American cities, uh, die before their first birthday, as, as in France. Um, we do launch a crusade to, to deal with this, but it has a different flavor than what happened in France. The main focus of American infant mortality crusaders in the early 1900s was to reduce deaths of older babies from diarrhea, from contaminated milk. And a lot of effort was put into that uh, with pasteurized milk and the, and the like. Um, the second leading cause of death of infants, which was neonatal mortality, which is mainly premature babies, um, got a much more ambivalent response among infant mortality crusaders. Um, they weren't so sure they wanted to put a lot of energy into that one. 
And now I think we get into, uh, this took me a while in my work before I started to realize this, but why was there an ambivalence back to taking care of saving a, you know, a, a, a 36 weeker, you know, like to me, it's like a no brainer. 36 weeker should be the most straightforward thing in the world. We should be saving those babies, right? They're not that sick. But in this age, babies are born one to two months early. They weren't just called, first of all, they weren't called preterm. Preterm is our word for early. They were called premature. When you do history, the hard, it's, it's not hard when you encounter a word you don't recognize. You know to look that up. Besides, you see a word and you think you know what it means. But in fact, you don't. Premature did not mean preterm. It meant not fully mature. And that could be because something is wrong with the baby. Um, and they would use it synonymously with weak infants, or so they call these babies just weaklings. That's the word used in, in, in textbooks at this time, saving premature and weak babies. And here's the thing. It's widely believed that premature birth was, according in the words of one writer, nature's way of expelling a defective fetus. So even a baby is just born one to two months early, there is ambivalence about saving that baby. Not because, as we say, we're, you know, we're not worried about immature lungs, but because it's felt something could be wrong with them, something hereditary. <clears throat> and here's an, uh, a quotation from one of the leading members of the Children's Bureau, um, who is giving a big talk in 1915, you know, that the whole folk at a conference that's all about reason for mortality. But when she starts to talk about preemies, she changes her language. She says, these puny, ill-conditioned babies crowd out our welfare stations and hospitals. Many of them die in later infancy. Still others live on dragging out enfeebled existences, possibly finally becoming the progenitors of weaklings like themselves. So it's not a quality of life, like well, this, are we just keeping the baby alive for a year or so? The actual fear is they will grow up and create more weaklings. Now I think you can start to see why saving even just mildly premature babies is seen uh, with skepticism. And that skepticism actually increases as we go from 1900 to 1910 to 1920. Because the United States, uh, my sense is you've talked about this some, but the great eugenic movement, uh, a, a great eugenic movement is sweeping America, reaching its peak in the night around the time of the First World War, 1917 to 20, creating a lot of concern that <clears throat> basically the quality or national stock, if you will, the, of the American race is deteriorating and uh, a fear that we are sliding into a, a kind of degeneracy. In your locale in Chicago, and you may have heard about this story, uh, one of the, there was a remarkable ma one manifestation of the eugenics movement was a doctor named Harry Hazelden, who began a campaign where he said, I'm not gonna operate on babies with significant birth defects. Um, his name was Harry Hazelden. He got a lot of, created a controversy in the newspaper about that, but he stuck to his guns It became kind of a Dr. Jack Kevorkian, if you recognize that name, for the early, for the 1910s. And to try to reach out to people, promote his ideas that you shouldn't try to say babies with severe defects. He, he's a big eugenicist. He produces a silent movie called The Black Stork. Um, and uh, it becomes a big success. And I just show this image. That This could be a whole other talk that uh, has been said by historian Martin Pernick, you may have heard from. But uh, it's part of the background of, again, why Premies get lumped together with a variety of other, quote, unfit people. So now we're at our question, what happened? Let's talk about American, leading American doctors. So some of you are probably from Johns Hopkins. I hope you won't be offended by my question, by what I'm about to say, but Johns Hopkins likes to think of itself as the beginning of everything great in American medicine, right? Um, it's the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And, and it really was the great innovator of, of, of American medicine in the 1890s, 1900s. By all, we would expect neonatology to have been born at Johns Hopkins, okay? That's what should be expected, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't. This is a picture of the Dr. J. J. Whitridge Williams, um, the head obstetrician at, at, at Hopkins, wrote Williams Obstetrics, the textbook that I grew up with, a very influential figure, probably the most influential obstetrician in America. He ran the OB service. He's a national authority. Um, but with the nursery, he has a really very much a hands-off attitude toward the newborn nursery. Um, and uh, I found records of what, what happened there. 
when babies were born, after babies were born, they're pretty much left to the care of the mothers and nurses, mainly the mothers. Premature babies is the same thing. The, the mother is kind of left to the mother. And uh, if a premature baby died within as, as late as two weeks, it would just be called a stillborn. Isn't that remarkable? Stillborn, that label would last until two weeks. Williams believed that a lot of these deaths of these mild premature babies were actually from congenital syphilis. And he, had, he did studies where he lumped together fetal deaths and, and his, quote, stillbirths, and came up with stats to pass that, to substantiate that. So Williams, I mean, Williams comes from this very genteel upper crust background. I think you could see how some of these eugenic fears of the unfit propagate themselves would resonate with him. So this doesn't take off at Johns Hopkins. This is a bigger story than just Johns Hopkins. Um, I've mentioned that in France, OB and pediatrics were kind of coming together, okay? Um, and it seemed to be starting to form their own specialty. Um, in the United States, in this climate of eugenics and ambivalence by taking care of uh, small babies, obstetricians don't really see much to gain about alliance with pediatrics. They see much more to gain about alliance with surgery. So in America, obstetrics joins with surgery and comes OBGYN. And yes, it'll do that eventually in France as well, but that's what happens this time period. This was really tragic for newborns. Um, a lot of what happened in France was because you had these OB peds people. They were true perinatologists. In America, that, that doesn't happen. And, uh, and, and it's even more tragic because as you get to 1915, 1920, now finally most childbirths are moving into the hospital. So it really was plausible that, that we could provide, you know, provide incubator care. And yet this is happening as the OBs are losing interest. So uh, the literature of the time uses this, uh, begins to, many, many doctors writing the medical literature of the time begin to describe the newborn nursery as a no man's land. This of course being a phrase uh, borrowed from the First World War. Uh, no man's land though in this case, it's not between the Germans and the French, but between the two specialties. Obstetricians control the nurseries, um, uh, but that really do little for the infants and premature babies you know, who die are basically left alone. Um, and called stillbirths. Pediatricians do have more interest, but they don't have much access. Um, they, they can't access a lot of these nurseries. And honestly, I'm not sure how much they could, good, they could have done because they don't really appreciate breastfeeding. <laughs> they would have probably given babies their formula, which would have had its own issues. This distinction between OB and peds and this no man's land phenomenon is most striking in the East Coast cities, the most established hospitals, the most famous hospitals, if you will, also have these most entrenched boundary lines. And now at last we get to Chicago because it turns out, I think what I was trying to say, these boundaries get less strict in the Midwest and the West. Um, I mean, I think about how when I did my residency in Colorado, I learned to do circumcisions um, and we did them, not OB. It's a more fluid boundary. So Chicago turns out things are more fluid between OB and Pete's. Um, and um, so, Chicago's obstetrician, Joseph DeLee, actually because about the only obstetrician in America who really follows up on that French OBP tradition at first. Um, he, um, he, he is a great, he remembers the interventionist in childbirth. Actually, I think I've got a better picture here. Sorry about that. Um, DeLee will eventually become Williams' great rival uh, and become very important in OB here. He's utterly different than Williams at Hopkins though. Williams is Eastern European, Jewish background. He represents the kind of people that the upper crust <laughs> despised, if you will. Um, and it kind of makes sense that I don't think the themes of eugenics resonated with Delay <laughs> the way they might have had with some of the, the East Coast gentry. Mid, uh, Delay uh, does a lot of interesting things, promoting uh, midwifery among the poor, but also routine forceps among the wealthy. He sets up an incubator baby station. Um, and it's the first one in the United States. Um, he sets up some of these Lion Hot Leon uh, incubators, trained nurses, and uh, he seems to be on the right track, but he runs out of money. Uh, it is expensive. He can't support the nurses. And philanthropy, he couldn't raise the money through philanthropy. So he, his story is not long lasting, but it begins to bring, uh, and by the way, we can think about why philanthropy didn't come to the rescue, right? Uh, this is a questionable cause he's promoting probably to, Philanthropist. Um, anyway, he, he leaves this, but he plants a seed where Chicago is 
going to be, move forward. It turns out uh, before Dali closed the nursery, he moves his station, uh, the incubator station to a pediatrician named Isaac Abt. You know, anything about pediatric history, he's like one of the most famous pediatricians in the United States. Abt leaves it, but then another pediatrician who was associate of Abt uh, takes his own interest in the premature baby. Um, and uh, he won't work with Dali, but he, he becomes very interested in himself. This is Julius Hess, who we've mentioned before. Uh, it does seem that one spark for Julius Hess was he was aware of, of Martin Cooney's work, who Martin Cooney apparently came to Chicago's White City one time. But, but I think Hess's interest goes is deeper than that. I think it connects to Lee and Apt and these people in Chicago before. So look at the Hess bed um, and Hess's incubator. It is basically a, a metal shield and uh, uh, that's heated. Has made a big deal. You don't want to overstimulate the baby. You want to handle them as little as possible, shield them from stimuli. Really, the heart of Hess's nursery is to emphasize the role of the neonatal nurse. Um, and uh, in Hess's nursery, nurses, not doctors, do almost all the work. The doctors, like Hess, would just round once in the morning, and the nurse did everything else. They, they developed protocols to care for these babies. And the doctors would get reprimanded if they tried to do too much for the babies. The nurses, besides protocols, again, develop this philosophy of handle the baby as little as possible. Don't deplete them of energy. You sort of think of the problem of prematurity as a lack of energy. And um, they raise them with these, these protocols, and really protocols that historians of this time write about what they call scientific motherhood, how to raise a baby by the protocols of science. And these nurses are very much doing that. <clears throat> um, Hess's own work isn't to care for these babies day to day, but it's to try to counter the charges of the eugenicists. And his research is all outcome research. And he uses IQ tests. IQ tests, of course, were again, <clears throat> at least in the United States, they were developed by uh, eugenicists. They weren't invented by them, but they were developed by them. He uses IQ tests to study the long-term outcomes of his graduates. And in a big book he publishes, he shows that they actually grow up into children with comparable IQ to those of other children. And it's a wonderful thing. Uh, this will eventually start to make the care of premature babies respectable. Uh, interesting to think about what's happening here with this nursery. Why, why do I call this the eugenic nursery? Um, uh, you, know, you, you gotta wonder, what would, was this philosophy of minimal handling basically selecting for babies who are just kind of hardy survivors, who just gotta have tough protoplasm or meant to live, so therefore they did okay. Um, and the babies who were delicate just wouldn't have made it. I don't know, but there is a sense, it's a kind of nursery that's compatible with eugenics. That's, that's why I mean, this is so different than what we saw in France. <clears throat> when Hesper makes this textbook, um, he, he's gonna, he draw, here's the title, Premature and Congenitally Diseased Infants. He's drawing a firm line here between the early baby and the baby who has come to as hereditary disease. Uh, and that I think is a very firm moral line that he's that he's created. So this is a this is a key that this is sort of the climax of this three act story. You know that now the incubator is adapted to the United States, but it's really changed the process uh, and fitted the context of of eugenics. Well, um, this all seems like a long. Let's take a deep breath, stand up. This thing feels like a long time ago, right? It feels like a story that seems utterly different than the story of the modern intensive care nursery. <clears throat> and I don't, um, uh, there's a whole nother story about the rise of the intensive care nursery. Uh, we can talk about it in the questions. I don't think I wanna go into it too much here, but um, it's a story that involves the rise of high oxygen therapy and then the retrolinal fibroplasia and not the prematurity epidemic that leads to a backlash against the hands-off method and the incorporation of precise control of the babies in the 1960s and finally the rise of lots of technology. I'm gonna just skip these slides because I'm running out of time. I'm gonna blame this on the introduction that i um, saying too much about me. <clears throat> but by the 1970s, you have the rise, the 60s and 70s, the rise of what we think is the intense care nursery. <clears throat> now sitting on ventilators, monitors, IVs, all this stuff that so traumatized me. Um, it's not developed through RCTs, but through this very messy process of just trying things and seeing what works. Before the 70s, there's very little public debate about any of it um, and uh, whether limits were being transcended. It's kind of remarkable. It's just all happening behind the scenes. 
But an ethical backlash does happen not too long before I, I started to be exposed to it. And the interesting thing about this ethical debate in the 70s is that it centered not on the care of the premature babies who are being saved, but rather the what we call the congenitally handicapped infants. So when you talk to ethicists about the milestones of this time period, one of the milestones was a film produced um, it's called the, about the Hopkins, about a baby at Johns Hopkins who had Down syndrome and uh, was allowed to die without intervention. Um, and this was shown uh, in ethics conferences around the country. Um, but again, think about how it's really a story of, it's a focus on, quote, congenitally, um, a baby who, who, who would have been recognizable as the kind of baby the eugenicists would have had concerns about. A famous milestone in the lives of neonatal bioethics was an article by two people who ran the, two doctors running the Yale special care nursery, uh, who wrote an article about how babies with things like Down syndrome and congenital anomalies or spina bifida were pretty much allowed to not get any intervention. We're just kind of kept, kept apart. Um, this created a lot of controversy when it came out. But again, I see con continuity here in some of what was happening in the early 20th century. Um, when I was in the nursery, the big controversy was the baby doe controversy. <laughs> An infant born with Down syndrome and esophageal atresia, and that is repaired with difficulty. Uh, the parents felt the surgery was not in the interest of the child. They declined it, um, put the baby on morphine. The baby, the hospital went to court, but the baby did die. <laughs> and uh, this was the controversy that then caused the Reagan administration to respond um, um, in a certain kind of a pro-life kind of way, saying that um, uh, that these you know, babies with handicaps who are not being given expected therapy, uh, they set up a hotline uh, for, for anybody who suspects a baby is being undertreated to call and report the infant. Um, <clears throat> a lot going on here, and, and to be fair, there really was a lot of disturbing thinking and not treating some of these infants. Um, but it was a big controversy. Uh, that was happening while I was being trained <clears throat> um, and led to the debates we have today about <clears throat> um, you know, how, how do you define things like futility in, in, in infant care and quality of life. And those were the, the, the buzzwords of this time period to, to lead your way, way out of these difficult issues. And both those words turned out to be very problematic because I expect you guys know, you know, fertility decisions kind of highlighted how Hard it was to make judgments about that without better data. The data was often lacking. And quality of life is just shown to be a very problematic concept that doctors tended to rate quality of life of, of, preemie, of, 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 of preemie's futures. Doctors tended to rate quality of life much lower than their parents did. So it was all really quite a mess. <clears throat> and I, I really just wanted to kind of give you a flavor of that later period, because I know that's a whole other talk. I just felt like we could give you exposure, partly just so you know that I'm aware of it. But I want to just end up by just making a couple of comments about, you know, really, is there any relevance of this earlier story? You know, it's, it'd be pretty obvious that that last story has relevance to today. But what about this early story, you know, story from 1880 to 1920? And in closing, I'm going to argue that this story was important. And a way to think about it is to think that it's, it was in these years that doctors staked out the territory of neonatal medicine for themselves that pediatricians in particular did. So here's a dreadful American painting, although a pretty famous one, called American Progress by John Gass, depicting the taming of the American frontier. <clears throat> and it's a picture that shows technology having a pretty important role. Uh, just like when we tell the story of neonatal technology, it's often told as a story of technology expanding frontiers of viability. Here's the railway, the telegraph, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, steamships all moving forth to tame this empty wilderness in the painting. But just as in the painting, it wasn't really an empty wilderness, right? <laughs> this was a, there were Native Americans living in that wilderness, okay? Um, they are, they're marginalized this image. The image also doesn't, remind, you know, it makes you forget that, yeah, there's other groups that were contesting for this territory, even besides Native Americans. There was Mexico, there was Canada. <laughs> All of these were contesting. And officially this reminds us that, you know, we take for granted the borders of the United States, but there's nothing for granted, nothing inevitable about the United States having borders it, it has. It's a part of history. Similar, I think history 
is not just about showing us how we got to the present. It rem to me, history is more about helping us think that history might have gone a different direction. That our present is not the inevitable product of, 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 of history. It spurs us to think about other possibilities uh, that, that might have happened in the development, in this case, of neonatal medicine. <clears throat> and um, some of the things I think, I hope that have come through in this talk are, this made, this made me return to the present thinking about how really the boundary between OB and pediatrics is just really an unnatural thing, <laughs> okay? Um, it's really bad when I work in the nursery and I see the babies, but I don't know what's going on with the mothers. Um, and pediatricians do have sort of a, you know, we, both of us, OBs and PEDs, we take care of both mothers and babies, but we both, you know, it, we were sort of led to focus on one to the exclusion of the other. That's the way that our specializations focus shape our moral formation. This theme of the I see a nurse a substitute mother. Mothers were not replaced by machines in this story. They were actually, it was only when nurses came in, they were the ones who made it palatable to think of a baby being cared for in a hospital. And I, that, I find that a powerful idea. Quite frankly, when I was a resident, I was kind of resentful of the nurses because they're always telling me what to do and reprimanding me. But now I can really see that they have this great wisdom as representatives of the mother. And uh, they stand this long tradition a, a space, the no man space, created a space for women where you know, nurses became very powerful. <clears throat> and the last thing we may want to think about is how is this older, you know, this powerful um, cultural tradition of eugenics, how has that still shaped us today? Um, I did not think of myself as having connections to that um, when I was feeling like I was over treating uh, premature babies. Um, and I do think a lot of that distress, my moral distress came from just being in an enclosed space and doing painful procedures to infants. But I do wonder if I was too quick to underestimate the quality of life these babies could have, okay? And certainly later on in my career, I realized I definitely had, once I became a general pediatrician, could take care of these babies long-term. So that is it um, for what I wanted to share. And I'm not seeing any questions because I've been on the screen on our, what do we call it, the, the slideshow mode, that we'd be happy to take any comments or questions or. Okay, well, or I'm going to start. Of outrage. I'm just going to start, um, not outrage, but um, thank you. And we always like to the people just have to get to their computers. Um, I just want to comment a couple of things. First of all, I thought that was an absolutely superb lecture. I love how you. Um, made the narrative understandable. I love the way you um, brought in these other things that people would not anticipate. And really, as I said beforehand, show the fact that you're exactly right. These are not a fait accompli. I mean, I remember the first Chicago hospital was a hospital built by a woman named Mary Harris Thompson. And it was for the widows and orphans of, of the Civil War. And so in some ways, there's a natural correlation, diseases of women and children, right? But it's interesting how those things, you know, come apart, go together, the way we think about it. Just a personal Chicago connection. Hess, I'm, I'm sure you know this because I'm sure you did this for your book is, you know, Hess's papers are in the special collections archives. And I bet you there's a lot more treasures. Now, one of the things we're going to do, I'm going to let Peggy talk in a minute and see if Luke wants to say something. But... One of the things we're going to do after this lecture series is put together a list of resources for people who are interested to continue learning about these areas that you've highlighted, you know, the whole Cooney and, you know, Isaac Apt. And we didn't even talk about um, Chicago lying in hospital and Delee, who's a fascinating character. And, you know, I'm actually sitting right now as we speak in what they call the old CLI, Chicago lying in hospital. But um, let me let some of the people who are in the audience, especially Peggy, start. Thanks. Um, I loved your talk. And I have lots of questions for you that I'll, I'll wait till we're in our after session. But I, I wondered whether you could just um, give the, the spiel on Virginia Apgar that you skipped. Yeah, sorry. I, uh... 
I do try to respect end of deadlines. Uh, so, um, so when I try to tell the story of the rise of the shift from the hands-off nursery to the interventionist nursery, and I try to do it just like five slides, <laughs> and I didn't even have time for that today. I do think that was Virginia Abgar's score was one of the critical moments um, when she um, developed her score to rate you know, the condition of a, of a baby who's being resuscitated. The idea that every baby gets rated and resuscitated if possible, that ends the fiction of the late stillborn baby, okay? This old idea that you can call a baby stillborn even if they died a few days later, that goes away and it leads to a more aggressive approach. So I think that really is an important turning point in that sense. Thanks for that question. Answering Deb Warner, um, the Lee's papers are now in Kansas. Um, when I was, uh, did my research, I, I have looked at Hess's paper, the Lee's papers were, um, Northwest Memorial, I think had papers, had stored them in this place in South Chicago. And it was such a dangerous archive that when I went there, the cab driver would not pick me up again. <laughs> and the archivist had to drive me out. <laughs> so yeah, medical history is actually more dangerous than you might expect. <laughs> and, actually, and actually, before Luke talks, I just want to say one thing in public is that DeLee was courted heavily by U of C, and he was very much afraid that his maternity hospital would get taken over by the University of Chicago, the big academic place. And he was only um, chairman of OB for two years. He actually was very afraid of exactly the thing that happened to him. So, you know, just as you said, learning the history, um, you know, on one hand, we, you know, venerate Dalee, but Dalee was a very complicated person and did great things and complicated things. And today, I don't think he would have been loved the same way he was in his time, but Luke, you're on. I'm a little bit off of um, topic here, but relating to the very last thing you said, you said over time, you think you underestimated the quality of life in um, these premature infants. What, I'm curious if you can talk more about that and what caused you in your experience as general pediatrician to kind of make that assessment. So thanks, Luke. Um, why did I, what do I mean when I said I underestimated um, the quality of life for a lot of babies I was caring for? Well, I am speaking about me when I was a resident, okay? Um, and um, gosh, I, I uh, we had a, in the U.S. of Colorado, there was a, oh, the ICN, but we had, there was a, a little ward called the Chronic care unit um, for the ex preemies because you know in Colorado there's no oxygen so we couldn't get them home and they would stay there months and months and when every night I'd be on call every third or fourth night I would get paged up invariably to one of them to code them essentially and it was really emotionally traumatic for me uh, as it was for all of us um, it it was hard to imagine a good future for a small preemie when you were experiencing something like, you know, that kind of thing over and over. <clears throat> um, and I think, uh, oh, I don't want to go to detail about how I reacted, but I think I was kind of known for a lot of dark humor about how premature babies and things like that. And that's how I survived that. No one would ever, who knew me as a resident, would ever suspect that 10, 15 years down the road, I would become one of the main doctors caring for children with special needs. <laughs> it was an utter, shift and I got out into a different world. Once I started seeing children, um, seeing the graduates and seeing them regularly and seeing them not in the pathological wor world of the hospital, but the world of, you know, seeing them with their families, <laughs> seeing them coming from the home, I had a really different view of them. Um, and uh, that's what I'm trying to describe. I, I feel like I was mainly shaped by, by my immediate, immediate context. Um, I still wonder if there's some indirect role that just sort of cultural language that's floating in the air was still shaping me to be less, be more pessimistic about these babies. Um, but sure, the big factor was I just never saw the mothers or parents very much in, in the hospital. Later on, I really did. I saw how they, these babies had meaningful lives with them. But I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah, and we both trained in the 80s, which was a really different era, but... Let me let our friend Chris Krenner from Kansas. Dr. Krenner. 
Hello. Thank you. Um, and great talk. I really enjoyed it. And I want to say we've got a few of our medical students, our top medical students from University of Kansas are also sitting in here. So uh, um, thank you so much. I wanted to ask about the, the divide between hospital and home. And a lot of the story early is about what would have been a minor part of medical care in hospitals. When did babies start being brought in from home birth to come into the hospital? And a little bit you might, I wondered about how eugenics plays out in a different setting. Hospitals at this time were, you know, the resource of the of urban immigrant populations, which would have been sort of a tar natural target. But is there a eugenics that plays out outside the hospital in these kind of birth stories, or is it, or how does it shift? Curious. Um, well, lots of questions here, but um, thanks again. I'm eager to hear your insights. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, the first one I think I understand better than the second one because it's better documented. Um, but uh, see, here's the thing that's really important to understand about infant hospital, about children's hospitals in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. Uh, they evolved out of what were previously known as foundling hospitals, um, places, institutions where one would take a baby who's being abandoned, okay? Um, and this was a huge issue, you know, you know, New York had a giant foundling hospital. It had to close its doors within four months after 1,200 babies had been left there. Um, and those kind of institutions, um, which were initially were just death traps, you know, where all these babies were brought in, they couldn't possibly take care of them. They gradually get taken over by doctors and get turned into the early infant uh, and children's hospitals, okay? But parents aren't so quick to be sure <laughs> that they that th these institutions I think, still have a lot of connotations of death uh, from the standpoint of parents. The mortality rate of, what I understand, infants under one year who were put into an infant hospital, say around 1900 in, in New York, it's about a 50% death rate. Um, they just didn't do well at all. I think people are aware of that. So imagine now you have a baby born at home, um, is really delicate. And yeah, the hospital is an option, but you but you know that very high chance your baby is going to die there. You're probably not going to rush your infant down there. You're going to do what you can before you do that, um, before you you take the baby there. And indeed, that's what I found when I studied the records. I initially assumed that the problem for the infant hospitals in this context was that mothers try to get the babies really quickly to the hospital, but even in the course of a few hours, they, they deteriorated. That wasn't it. Most mothers brought their babies to the hospital after several days, not after a few hours. They clearly were trying what they could at home and only the ones who they couldn't save were they bring in the hospital. And then at that point, it was too late. And the doctors who tried to save those babies with incubators, they literally would have a 90% plus death rate. So, so that does that help a little bit? You're, I'm really glad you asked that question because I, 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 I didn't, it has a chapter in the book, but it didn't make it into the talk. I need a restating of the other question if you want to try that again. I didn't totally get it, sorry. Uh, there might be other things to talk about. And, um, I was thinking about okay. eugenics and it uh, obviously is easier uh, to picture in the hospital setting where it is a vulnerable population. But I wondered if in the, a period when not so many newborn children are coming into the hospital, it still is a factor somehow and how that, if there's a, Different, oh. advice, different advice outside the hospital than inside the hospital. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, now I got it, now I got it. So I was kind of surprised when I, the first group of sources I looked at in doing this project so long ago uh, were the pediatricians. And they never wrote about eugenics. They, they just talked about the technology trying to save the babies. Uh, um, it, it reminded me of modern neonatologists who I've interviewed in the 70s. And I said, did race influence what you do? And they said, no, we were colorblind. They all look the same. They never talk about it. Um, and I, I didn't see, I only saw the eugenic stuff coming up explicitly when I shifted focus from the doctors to the, to the people working for health departments, <laughs> the, the women who are doing the visiting home nurses, who, uh, you know, after 1910, 1920, you get you know, health departments are being to send mothers to do home visits. It's sitting, I'm sorry, nurses to do home visits. Um, and they visit all newborns in places like New York. And that's where you start to see these comments about I, that slide, for example, I showed you about these puny ill-conditioned infants are going to crowd our institutions. 
that comes from one of those people. <laughs> They're the ones who express the ambivalence. Um, and they often use that word weakling rather than premature too. That, so I, does that help? That, that, that's, that's where I saw it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the question. Those are good, uh, helpful, clarifying questions, I think, because things I didn't talk about. Peggy, you want to continue the conversation? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious. The Who Shall Survive um, movie is a great movie, and, and the version that's available through Indiana University has a post-movie conversation between Bob Cook and Bill Curran, uh, Sidney Callahan, and a couple other people. Um, which and it's super super interesting to to listen to and it and it seems as though it was primed to make an impact but it didn't in my opinion it didn't make an impact on the public I I think it might have made an impact a lot of impact on on physicians but public awareness of this didn't of, of the non-treatment issue didn't really come about until the baby doe cases of the early 80s and and um and then in the mid eighties, there was a, a reporter named Carlton Sher Sherwood from CNN that uh, did a three part series. that's amazing, amazingly hard hitting. It's available through the Minnesota's disabilities um, site. Uh, and he goes through the spina bifida cases from Oklahoma, the, the non-treatment of the non-treatment algorithm of of, I think it was Richard Gross. Um, and then he includes the whole Who Shall Survive uh, movie, which is only nine minutes long <laughs> um, in, the, in the final piece of it. And I'm curious if I, I can't, I don't actually know how to do research on media. So if that had any effect on the public's perception of, um the treatment of of disabled children um or if it just fell on on deaf ears i don't know cnn was i guess somewhat new in in the at the time um did it make any impact did it have any effect and and more generally um the if you have any comments on the oklahoma spina bifida um situation i'd be interested in those so really good questions peggy i, I really am more of a historian of this early period and i have an amateur's knowledge of the later period but i would not i moved to, to other areas after this okay so I, I you're raising some really interesting questions that i would like to know more about um it it does uh, i i share your opinion that the the um the movies of the 70s really didn't seem to have much broader cultural impact at that point. Um, uh, Baby Doe had more. CNN, that's really fascinating. I don't, I don't know. Are you, are you going to study this yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a book where this is the context and sort of the 71 to the, the 71 case to the Baby Doe's of the 80s and the Danville twins. And the spina bifida. So, so that's the context in which I'd like to situate my story I have to tell. Can you write me offline? <laughs> I would love to. So I would love to. Respond more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Deb, for that the reference. Yeah. I came close to doing part two, but I, I didn't. <laughs> Happens as the dang thing about being a doctor, you just do all this other stuff. Anyway, but th th those are really great questions. I think they, they really point to where this needs to be studied. Um, Lourdes Rodriguez, you want to take the floor? Hi, right, thank you so much. Um, so I'm sorry about the background. Um, so I'm actually currently a student at U Chicago, and I am really, I don't know, I, I found your talk really interesting. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, if I may ask a quick question about, um, I understand that part of like the early French developments um, did also include follow up with some of the graduates of the, with some of the graduates um, of neonatal and perinatal care. What I'm wondering is that did that also follow through when um, 
when hospitals within the U.S. or just like different institutions within the U.S. started to adopt the practice of taking care of those infants? Yeah, really, really great question, Lourdes. Really good question. Did was it picked up on in the United? The, the practice of following up the babies was that picked up in the United States? Um, and and um, not uh, it was picked up by a different group of people. So I uh, really. Uh, so I told you, uh, so the obstetricians, first of all, don't do it so much, okay? Because they, in the United States focus, I've mentioned much more on the mother and, and intervention with the mother. So they, they really don't do it as far as I can see in this period. Um, pediatricians addressing the infant mortality were all about giving the baby clean milk. And these were called milk stations, early 1900s. Um, and they didn't work because <laughs> you could give the baby a nice bottle of pasteurized milk, they take them to their house and they spoil and the baby still gets E. coli, okay. So by about 1910, there's a pushback, push for a different approach um, to reduce an infant mortality. And it's realized it's not enough to give the baby a bottle of milk. You need to educate the mother. And so the person who actually introduces this approach, supervising the mother to the United States, is not an obstetrician, it's not a pediatrician. It's, uh, is Sarah Josephine Baker, the first woman uh, uh, physician who directed New York's Bureau of Ch Child Hy Infant Hygiene. Um, she's a woman who couldn't, she wasn't led into the pediatric club. She creates a different kind of career focused on infant welfare. I I'm sorry, on infant public health, I'm sorry. And she discovers Boudin's work, okay, in, in France and says, we can do this. Uh, and she takes the city's nurses and doctors to supervise the babies. So that's what happens here. Um, so a little bit of a complicated story, so it influences us, but not among the obstetricians. Um, we could maybe see Julius Hess's studies of the IQ of babies long-term as being kind of an echo of that, but I think Sarah Josephine Baker would really be my, my vote for who picks up on this. So before, question. before we let you go, Jeff, I just wanted to say one thing is I love the fact that your traumatic experience in the NICU kind of propelled you into this work. And in some ways, it's a good example of how our clinical lives can really move us forward, whether it's in positive or in anxiety provoking ways that make us really want to come to terms with things. And um, I just want to thank you on behalf of the McLean Center and give you at least a few minutes to get up and stretch your legs before you're on the afternoon session. and. Thank you on behalf of all of us. I thought that talk was outstanding. And thanks, Deb, for all the typing there where you're helping us find all these resources. I promise to share them over time with this entire group.